At this point in the series, you might be hearing a voice in your head that all this ray marching nonsense are some convoluted steps just to render basic shapes, which can be rendered from the get-go using Mesh Instance 3D node. So why even bother with ray marching? That's a pretty solid question, but ray marching is much more than rendering just these primitive shapes. The very first thing is performance. Let's look at these views. One is a standard mesh, and another is ray marched onto the box mesh. If you take a look at the geometry, the standard sphere has a lot more vertices than the ray march sphere, which has only 8. And if I be a bit more clever, I can have a lot of spheres by bending and folding the space with virtually no extra performance penalty. We can also display several ray march shapes. Now you could argue that you can do the same thing by a simple vertex displacement shader. Yes, you are right, but just look at this example. Here the right side flag mesh is using a vertex displacement shader, left flag is using ray marching. And for vertex displacement, we need extra geometry to make it work. Also I have to be very careful when tweaking the parameters. If I try to go a bit extreme, I will get this blocky result, because my flag mesh doesn't have very detailed geometry. However, my ray march flag doesn't have such limitations and it is still using only 8 vertices. I can even create a more complex shape using so-called union, intersection, and boolean operations. And there is much more. So let me show you how we can unleash the true power of the ray marching using these operators. But before we get started, I want to say thank you to Arthur for his awesome explanation about my matrix multiplication conundrum from the previous episode. So Arthur, you're breathtaking. Okay, so my actual box mesh here is 5 meters wide in all directions and I'm using the shader from the last episode which is only rendering the cube currently. Now we already know that we can move our shape by subtracting a vector from our point P. Let me just make my cube ping pong left and right. And we have our cube moving left and right. So that's how we move our cube. Now let's look at rotation. For 3D rotation, quaternions are the best, but that's the topic for some other day. Right now to keep things simple, let's just create a function that will return a 2 by 2 rotation matrix. So here, mat2 rotation and it will take angle in radians. And I've already explained how to plot a 2 by 2 rotation matrix in Rotate UV video. Then in our SDF function, let's say I want to rotate my shape around Y axis. So I can go P.XZ equals rotation of time multiply P.XZ. So basically this will rotate my shape around axis which is missing here. In other words, if I want to rotate the cube around Z axis, I would go P.XY. And here the order of operation is very important. Let's say I'm moving the cube first. It will be like this, but if I flip the order of operation and let me fix the translation to better understand what is going on here. So, two units on the x-axis. See, my cube is now basically orbiting around the origin. So keep this in mind. Now you can also twist the shape. For that, I basically have to set different rotation for each point. So first, instead of time, let's put one here. So right now, I'm setting the same rotation for every point, but I can change that. Let's say I want to change the rotation based on height, so I will simply go 1 into p.y. And I can also determine where this twisting effect should start using smooth step. So my PY is 0 at the origin and for cube it goes from minus 0.5 to 0.5. So I can wrap my PY in smooth step. And I don't want to twist the cube for the bottom half so 0 and 1. And I have an entire video about smooth step. So if you don't understand what is going on definitely check that out. Okay so that's all for rotation. Let's check out scale. Okay now it's definitely not very smart of me to scale our box because I can literally scale the box in each axis using this half size parameter. So let's render a sphere instead. And for now let me comment the rotation code. 
Okay, so let's say I want to scale my sphere in Y axis, basically squash it. Then I will go Vec3 scale equals Vec3 1 0 0.51 then P divide equals scale. Now the sphere is squashed but I will get this weird glitch. Because our distance is now invalid from this side, basically the ray is just not hitting the surface from this angle. So to fix it, I need to multiply the distance with the smallest component of the scale vector. So here I will go multiply minimum of scale dot x and again minimum of scale dot y and scale dot z. And now it looks fine. Now let's say I go a bit extreme. Let's put 0 0.1 here. I'm once again getting this weird artifact. And this simply means that we are not marching for enough steps. So to fix this, I can just increase my max steps. And that will fix that. Also keep in mind that you should keep max step and max distance as low as possible and surface distance as high as you can get away with in your shaders for the performance reasons. Also don't put zero in any of the component of the scale vector because then you will run into divide by zero error. Now let me render the box once again. Set the scale to 2. Let's say I want to keep the bottom half bigger in x and z axis. So I can go scale.xz equals vec2 of mix 1 and 2 and then smooth step of p.y and this time my p.y can go minus 1 to 1. I want to keep bottom half bigger so I will go 1 and minus 1. So smooth step will give me 0 for the top part and 1 for the bottom and mix function will return 1 if this input is 0 and 2 if this is 1 and will return the interpolated value for the in between. Now I can see some screw up going on around here. This means the ray marcher is overstepping here. So I need to multiply some smaller number here to make the step size smaller. Again make sure to put the highest possible value because this 0.5 means I'm making the ray marching for this box twice expensive because I halved the step size. So the ray marcher will need twice the steps to reach the same hit point. So let's try 0 0.07, 8, 0 0.09. Yep, I can get away with 0 0.9. Okay, now here I can easily control at which point the scaling will happen by tweaking the smooth step. I can also control the scale itself by tweaking the mix function. So that's all for scaling. Let's check out union. So union basically means if you have two shapes, simply draw both of them. So let me first render a sphere. Let's move the sphere 1 meter right side, so P minus equals vec3 of 1, 0, 0. And now I have actually modified my point P, so if I draw another shape with it, it will also have this translation. So it is a good idea to use separate variables for each shape. So here instead of P, I will go vec3 SP equals P minus vec3 and use SP here. Let's draw another shape a box this time which is one meter left side and now to render both shapes I can simply use min function so d equals minimum of sphere and box now you can see this sharp line here it can be smoothed out using smooth min function smooth min function is not readily available in Godot but it is available in shaderlib version 2.2.2 so make sure to download that so to use smooth min First, I need to include its shader include file in my shader. Hash include and the path of our shader include file. Then instead of min, we will use smooth min. And it has a third input parameter for smoothing. Let's try point 0.1, point 0.2 maybe. And that is union. Let's check out intersection. So intersection means only render the overlap part of the two shapes and to do that instead of min I will use max function and now you only see the intersected part by both sphere and box. 
Here I can also smooth out this edge using smooth max function. But first I have to include its shader include file. Hash include and then path of smooth max shader include file. Then here instead of max, you guessed it, smooth max. In the third parameter, let's pass 0.2 and that is all for the intersection. Now let's check out boolean. So let's say I have a sphere and a box. If I want to cut out the sphere from the box, that is called a boolean operation. For that, we can use max function. So max of sphere and box. And now I want to cut the sphere from the box, so I will invert the sphere. If I want to cut out box from sphere, I can invert the box distance instead. I can also use smooth max function to smooth out the edges. Smooth max. And I want to cut out sphere, so minus sphere, box, and 0.2. And that's all for the boolean operation. You can also morph one shape into another. Let's say I have a box and a sphere. Then I can morph between them using mix function. So d equals mix of sphere and a box. And here let me pass a value that ping pongs between 0 and 1. You can of course use smooth step as well. Smooth step function is really OP. Let's try smooth step, minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and p.x. So I have a sphere to the left and as we move to the right, it slowly morphs into a box. So that's morphing. Now let's say I have a box and this box is a solid box. Let me just cut it in half so we can see. So basically I was trying to say that this box is solid even from the inside and I can make it into a hollow shape. You already know from the previous episode about exterior and interior distances. So our SD box function returns positive distance for the surface and negative for the inside. So I can simply wrap my SD box function in absolute function. And now it looks like this because our box is now just very thin surface basically. Then to add a thickness, I can subtract some value here and we have a hollow shape. Similarly, I can also displace the shape. Let's say I have a box. Then here I can subtract some value to add a distortion. Kind of looks like a bevel operation. It has smoothed out the edges. But I can pass some different value to make it distort. Let's try good old sine waves. And this will return minus 1 to 1, so let's dial it down by multiplying some smaller number. Now if you look closely, you can see there is some screw up going on here. Like from here, it looks like the shape has been chipped in. And what is happening here is that the ray marcher is marching inside that bump and hence the distance has become invalidated. Let's say I have this edge, which is the surface of the box. This pink bump is our distortion. Here is our camera. Now let's say we want to march toward this bump. So the SD box function will give us this closest distance from the surface and we will march forward that much distance. From this new point, we will again get the closest distance. We will march once again, rinse and repeat. But now from this point, our SD box will return the closest distance to the actual surface. It won't consider this bump. So what will happen is we will march inside the shape on the next step. So if this happens, we want to march back to the surface. So here in the ray marching loop, here I'm getting this closest distance. So if I'm inside the bump, it will be negative. So I'm marching back that much distance once, but then my break condition will evaluate to true. Let's say I march 10 units inside the shape, so minus 10, but it will be less than surface distance, so it will break out the loop. I don't want that. I only want to break the loop if the distance is closer to the surface, so... I can wrap the ds into absolute and the screw up is gone. Now let's say I make these waves a bit steeper. 
now I'm getting this weird glitch. And what is happening here is, now my ray marcher is overstepping these waves. So once again we have the box edge, our distortion bump and the camera. We will get the distance and march forward. And oops, the ray marcher entirely overstepped the bump. So when this happens, I need to actually make this step size smaller. We've already seen this issue in the scaling, but now you have a better idea. So to make this step size smaller, I have to multiply some smaller number to this entire thing. Once again, try to keep this number as big as possible. So 0 0.7, 0 0.8, nope, let's keep it 0 0.7. And that's distortion. You can also mirror the shapes. Let's say I have this rotated and scaled box once again. And I want to mirror this to the left side so I can go p.x equals absolute of p.x. And we have mirrored shape. Let me move it a bit to the right side so you can see better. And we have two shapes. And the cool thing is the second shape is almost entirely free. Not completely because our ray marcher still has to march to that but that's relatively cheap. You can also mirror in y axis, here instead of p.x, simply go xy. But this is only helpful if I need to mirror x, y or z axis. Let's say I want to mirror around some arbitrary angle. For that I can go vac3 plane normal equals vac3 of 0, 1, 0 and normalize that. Think of this plane normal as the actual normal of the plane mesh. So currently this is pointing up. So the object will be mirrored on x, z plane. Then I can go p minus equals 2 into plane normal into max of 0 and dot product of p and plane normal. So this max is reflecting the bottom side at the top. If I use min it will reflect the top side in the bottom. Now let's say I want to mirror around 45 degrees so I will pass 110 in the plane normal. So basically this part is reflecting here. And this is all modeling techniques so with this you can model quite a bit using just maths. So here is a homework for you. <coughs> I mean a fun little challenge. Try to create this pokeball using all these techniques. It's not very complicated, it's easy enough. Once done, see if you can animate it. And that's pretty much the video. If you have any questions, post them in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, chances are high that you might enjoy my other videos as well. So do check them out. That's it from me and I will see you guys in the next one.